possibility that I'd be let out after a year hinged on the condition of good behavior. Since my canteen had been cut off and I couldn't watch TV or play basketball for a month, somewhere something had been logged on my record. I went around asking anyone who'd listen, inmates and guards alike, what they thought would happen. Some said not to worry about it, that it was minor and in three months I'd be drinking a beer on a sandy beach. Many, though, said I'd screwed up, that I might as well get settled in for four more years. The team said I was screwed, said Mike said he'd write. The big-bellied Hopi guard who fell asleep at his desk all the time and sneaked at cigarettes, he'd walk by and pretend to drop them out of his pack without noticing, said to make out a will and laughed his butt off. I daydreamed through the next few weeks thinking about it. Psych Mike would be talking to me for 15 minutes straight until I realized I hadn't heard a word he said. Four more years, four more years paraded through my thoughts like a presidential campaign chant. It was after about a month of this that I decided to escape. Behind women, partying, and how you landed in jail in the first place, escaping was the next most talked about subject. Without fail, if someone had his mouth open, he was talking about one of the above. There were two ways to make a break for it. The most complicated involved playing sick and setting up a nurse's appointment for the next day. One of the guards would drive the sick sicklies in a white van to the clinic at the edge of town about 10 minutes away, always after breakfast but before lunch. But before then, you called one of your relatives or friends and told them when you would be there. And when the guard wasn't looking, which was always, you went out back and jumped in the car and were long gone. But I didn't know a soul between Oakland and Albuquerque, and no one within a million miles willing to drive all day and night to the middle of the Hopi Reservation and aid and abet a jailbreak. So that meant the second option, simply crawling out of the ceiling. I never knew if it was a case of the guards not knowing how or if they didn't, didn't know or didn't care, but a, about half a dozen had broken out in 10 months. Every time someone escaped, guards usually just went around the perimeter of the fence, banging it here and there with nightsticks, or made their rounds inside our quad checking underneath our bunks and going through our underwear when the answer was right above their heads. Before I broke out, I wrote a letter to Dad, hinting that I might be coming back soon. Dear Shorty, what kind of bird don't fly? Can you believe it? I've almost done a year, but my time in the Endorsement Society, as you call it, is running short. Right about now, I fancy a drop. That's British for I need a drink. Learned that in a book. Yes, they have books here and I've read all three of them. I've lost about 25 pounds, so when I get back, we'll throw a hog in the fire or something. Get those clippers ready because I need another haircut. Or did you hawk them again for a jug? I signed it, your son, Jordan the Jailbird in arid Zona. It was common knowledge around in, among inmates that one single ceiling panel near the rear of our wing entered into a crawl space that traversed diagonally across the guard's control booth and passed offices leading to the weight room. On the roof of that room was one of those cone-shaped silver exhaust fans that spun like a top in the wind, but other than that served no visible purpose. It wasn't bolted down or hooked to anything, and could be pushed off its base and returned snug. The teen knew all this because his brother had fled a few months earlier and was now living temporarily in Tempe. The plan for us was to make it to his house on Second Mesa, about 20 miles away, where his uncle would drive us off the res and into Flagstaff. 
We had to each save three or four bologna sandwiches and cookies for the journey. And I had that check for 500 Cynthia forwarded me from the gallery. After the guard made his bed check, walking by each bunk with a clipboard, sometimes stopping to chat with a prisoner who, chances were, was a relative, the lights were dimmed to a foggy, dull yellow. We waited a few minutes, then stacked the plastic chairs underneath the ceiling panel while someone looked out. The teen went first, pushing the panel up and over and lifting himself up like you do dip exercises in the, den in the gym. I knew it was game on when he reached down to grab the sandwiches and the flashlight. The flashlight I had filched from someone's house in Palaka when I chopped firewood for the old ladies. I had a split second to change my mind, but didn't. The only reason I was doing this was I thought that as a non-felon offender, the only way I'd be caught and returned to jail is if I went back to the Pueblo, which as far as I was concerned, no longer existed. I figured if the Hopis could do it and go no farther than Phoenix, they sure as hell wouldn't come after me in the Tenderloin. Inching on my knees through the narrow tunnel, trying to be quiet and not cough from dust and mouse turds, with my heart beat thumping in my ears. I envisioned them below hustling to get the chairs back in place and get into bed so they could act like they had been asleep in case a guard came back. And when the officers came around asking each inmate what he knew about the escape, which they would as soon as count right after breakfast, I imagined them with newspapers flipped up, ignoring questions, or on their stomachs faking sleep as I myself had done in six interrogations. By then, I'd be on a bus halfway to San Francisco, somewhere near 29 Palms, thanking God and Greyhound I was gone. A silver spray of stars greeted us on the roof, where we replaced the fan and crawled on our bellies to the edge of the building. There were no vehicle lights for miles all around, no one in the parking lot or walking around in the yard. It sounds like out of a western, but far off a coyote howled, then a bunch joined in a chorus. Following the teen, I jumped, dropped, and rolled from the one-story structure and jogged after him hunchback-like down a trail between two junipers and into an arroyo. A whole spider web of these miniature canyons connected the reservation, and the teen was on intimate terms with them. They were seven or eight feet deep, so you were invisible to anyone on the highway, and with the moon and cloudless night, it wasn't hard seeing in front of you. The teen never said a word. I just followed him in a light jog like we were two suburbanites out for a moonlight run next to some big city river walk. We ran until we came to the spot where his cousin had left a sack of clothes and a plastic white grocery sack. We stopped and changed burying the blaze orange jail suits under piles of rocks and quickly ate the sandwiches. He had told his cousin over the phone in Hopi that I was about as big as the cousin, so the jeans and t-shirt fit well, but he had left a pair of tan alligator hide dress shoes that looked absurd, though not as bizarre as my linoleum, linoleum brown jail slippers. We started off again due west, walking at a steady clip with the teen sometimes scrambling up a slope out of the canyon to get his bearings. He motioned me over and pointed at his starlit mesa, which rose in black silhouette in the clear night, close, but yet so far. The more we walked, the farther away the mesa seemed to appear, like a big chess piece on the retreat. Since we had to follow the snaky ancient riverbed, we probably walked three miles to every one in actual distance. I kept hearing things scurry away across rocks and crash into the brittle weeds. Lizards. Could be timbler rattlers, though, the teen said, and laughed in the silence when he saw my expression. Slowly, then with startling clarity, I began to see my breath in the pre-dawn chill. And as it grew light, the teen nodded toward an adobe house with a yellow porch light near the edge of the mesa. The light was only on at certain times, he said. We stayed under cover of the arroyo until we were right near the house. There's my dog Apache, 
the teen whispered, pointing at a brindle-colored pit bull, which came charging at us when we crawled out onto the rim of the little gorge. I thought it was going to attack, but when it saw the teen, it whimpered in a low howl, barked once, and jumped up with paws on the teen's chest, tail thumping the ground. The teen scrubbed its head and let it lick his face. The dog went to me for a brief instant, then right, went, went right back to the teen, so happy it began to piss. <laughs> there was an orange van. Apparently, we were to creep in back and wait until his uncle came out at dawn, but there was a note stuck in the driver's door. Under flashlight, it read, Sorry, nephew, but you were on your own. Can't risk it. Keys and money under the mat. Be careful and call. They'll come here looking. You know what to do with the van. I took a leak myself as the sun lit up a gold horizontal streak to the east, and the first icicle of light jabbed my eye. I inhaled the delicious smell of burning pine and exhaled memories. A warm, squishy squirrel belly, Grandpa's 410, the World Series in daytime, scotch and water. The structure had a quaint, oddball mixture of brown adobe, modern oak doors, window screening, plaster, white cinder block, red brick, aluminum, and tinted windows. Like it had been masoned together carefully over the decades by Picasso in a cubist fit. With cars and trucks parked at odd angles here and there, and bikes and toys scattered across the yard, which overlooked the sweeping canyon floor we had just covered, it looked like a very comfy place to live if you weren't an escaped convict. The land slanted downward from the mesa and in its undulating sameness created the illusion of illusion. What seemed close was far and vice versa. Leg muscles still twitching after the six hour walk. I squinted to see the arroyo we had just covered but it was impossible, covered under a vast blanket of juniper shadow and mist. The team said it was about two hours to Flagstaff and there were two hours until bed check at the jail. He led Apache in and started the van and when he floored it I fell back ass over tea kettle, tea kettle chair and all. The teen laughed saying his uncle usually took out the passenger's chair to let his dog stand up front when they went on the ride so the seat was never bolted down. Sorry, he said, but he forgot. But the moment lightened the mood. I, for one, was jittery with the sensation of freedom. Cool, clean air, money, a ride, real clothes, cigarettes, and a bottle of Tavarsky vodka the teen had found under his seat. We had actually made it. The teen was going to see his girlfriend in Phoenix and start a new life. They wanted to have babies, he said said he was sick of the reservation. I, at that moment, would have traded places with him. The sight of the house and smell of the smoke had struck a chord in me. It spoke of stability, roots, heritage, a sense of belonging and a middle finger at the modern world. The kid, he'd be back like a moth to flame. Me? Who knew? That's it. <laughs>